Hello, and welcome to the Learn to Code podcast here at One Month. My name's Chris. Data journalism is an umbrella term that includes various tools and techniques and you know different approaches to storytelling, storytelling using data. Data journalism includes everything from uh, reporting on various sources that you that a traditional journalist you could imagine might seek out and putting those together into some visualization or uh, analysis. And on the you know more technological kind of higher end spectrum, it's also using tools and different languages like Python to comb through large data sets. Uh, data journalists do this to either for some for some stories maybe add context you know to a story um, or also to find new stories that we might not have been able to see without looking at the data graphing it over time looking for patterns this kind of thing two of the most popular languages that data journalists use um, number one is python and number two is sql um, these languages are used by reporters at the new york times cnbc dow jones government, as well as different industries like in real estate, Redfin uses them, um, as well as Coindesk is hiring data journalists for reporting on cryptocurrencies and, um, you know, in that space. NICAR is the largest data journalism conference in the United States. And last year, Melissa Lewis held a workshop, specifically an intermediate workshop on using Python for data journalists. It was called PyCar, which is basically, I think it was Python for people at NICAR, more or less. Um, And today on the show, Melissa is going to join us to share some highlights from her workshop, as well as answer some of my questions, such as what is data journalism to her and why is it so important these days? Why are Python and SQL considered the best languages? And are there specific libraries or skills within those languages that we should be paying attention to? for people who want to get into data journalism, as well as some of her favorite sources and people doing data journalism these days so that we can follow them and learn from them and get inspired by some of the good work that's being done out there today. So without any further ado, here's my conversation with Melissa Lewis. So I wanted to get into uh, a conversation about data journalism and how coding is influencing um, journalism. And so my first question would be, what is data journalism? And yeah, let's start there. What is data journalism? Um, that's That can be a hairy one, but I have thought about it. So um, part of the problem with data journalism is that it encompasses a lot of different disciplines. Like if you were to go outside of data journalism, those things would be called different things from data analyst to designer, data engineer. Sometimes you're a de facto developer. So it encompasses a lot of things, but I think they're, they're, I like to break them up into um, a few categories. So uh, I think in terms of presentation, you know, it can manifest as graphics, uh, like Emily Ang of the Seattle Times did a graphic on uh, King County transportation money, what it's costing you. Um, so that was a flat graphic and super informative, um, but it can also manifest as an interactive, like a database, like, um, Uh, I've worked on a government salaries database for Oregon. Uh, Texas Tribune has a government salaries explorer. Um, NJ.com just had a a force report. Uh, I'll talk more about that later because I think it encompasses a lot of different types of data journalism. Uh, But data journalism can also be data reporting, and that's more what I do now. It's it's more what I'm interested in doing, which uh, encompasses, you know, things like records requests and a lot of things that what you would call like a reporter simpliciter uh, would do, but sometimes that results in a lot of data uh, that requires a cleaning analysis, transformation, and the like. So that's also data journalism. All right. Let me, um, let me kind of, let me break this down a little bit because this is, this world is new to me. So I guess the, the first thing I'm wondering is, is, is the data journalist the person who is we think of as the journalist who's publishing the story, or is the data journalist the person who is doing the research that informs the story, or, or is it a bit of both? What's that like? It's a bit of both, um, and I think that's actually a source of tension for some data journalists. Um, I have done very little writing so far. I'd like to do more writing, um, but you know the preferences vary. Sometimes the data journalist is doing all of it. Um, but I, in my experience, they're a a little more segmented where like the, um, what's called like finding the character, 
uh, doing interviews and the writing is often on the other reporter. And then I do things like analysis and participate in records requests and the like. Hmm. Yeah, you, you gave a few examples of people using data journalism for making tables or can, can you can you break down one example um like i'm just trying to picture like what i guess it seems like data journalism so many things is kind of what i'm hearing yeah absolutely so uh like i could talk about like the government salaries explorer i've worked on so yeah that that great. entails like a submitting a records request to say um in Oregon, it's it's a lot of different agents. In most states, you're going to be requesting information from a lot of different agencies, and then collating those. Like you know, I I was putting that into a Postgres database, um, mm -hmm. and then from there, I made a, a, a my coworkers and I on the data team at the Oregonian made a Django application. So it's like a you know a web application. Um, but it, but it still requires some reporting because you can't just, it's not super compelling to just put data out there. Um, I think like the best examples of data journalism provide you a, a database, for example, but give you, um, through a combination of user interaction and reporting some ways of like finding stories for themselves, like empowering readers to find information for themselves. Yeah. What problem in this story, what problem were you trying to solve? I think people are interested in where their tax money goes, and that that can go in a lot of different directions, like programs. But you know, among the ways that people, I think, would be interested in, like how um, offices are compensated in their in their um, government, um, could be illustrative. Like, um, like I I was surprised to find, for example because I just didn't know what to imagine, that uh, there are a lot of highly paid um, nurses and doctors in the prison system in Oregon. Highly paid, um, so what, like making? Yeah, like, well, above, well, that is to say, um, above six figures is not surprising for a medical profession, but it is, it is surprising for a, a government employee. Um, but, you know, not all of those people are medical professionals. Like, I think, I think it would, users want to know uh, and readers want to know who is the highest paid person in my county and like does that make sense for me um yeah. is that public data i'm, I'm guessing you have access yeah to it? um there there are exemptions but um uh salary data is often um public record and indeed uh, we, we didn't publish it for a variety of privacy reasons, but, you know, we have information on things like uh, gender and ethnicity of government employees. So um, I, I'm not sure if they're still doing that because I'm no longer with the Oregonian, but they could, for example, analyze uh, pay disparity based on demographic information within office. But of course, that requires, you know, being able to analyze things like tenure in the position and the like. So it's it's a lot of lifting. Um so when you when you're on a story like this and you're looking through this data, is there a reason that this is called a data journalist and not just journalism? Like, couldn't you just kind of look through these records and like, I don't know, kind of page through them in an Excel sheet? Is there a, is there a level at which journalism becomes like data journalism where, you know, I'm trying I guess I'm really trying to kind of crack what what that nugget is that makes it that makes it have its own kind of skill set, you know? Yeah, I agree. Uh, I think data journalism has existed for a long time. The, there's actually, uh, there's NICAR, the conference that we talked about earlier, has been going on for, you know, well over two decades. I mean, it's so old that NICAR stands for, um, I think it's the uh, National Institute f uh, uh, for Computer Assisted Reporting. Like, this feels like such a retro name. Um, it's because like this has been part of reporting for a long time. Uh, Ida B. Wells used data in her journalism, but we don't call her a data journalist exactly. Um, so it is an old practice. And I think that the extent to which data specific skills inform your reporting is on a gradient. And I think there are a lot of people who don't call themselves data journalists, but are still very much doing that work. Um, and similarly, uh, I think I come from the opposite direction because I was a lab researcher 
and a software engineer pre prior to joining journalism. And so I'm finding journalism skills kind of lacking on my part. So in many ways, I feel like I don't, I shouldn't be able to call myself a data journalist because I don't have as many of those skills. Um, I'd, I'd say like on one end of the spectrum, you have um, fairly esoteric programming skills like um, wh what are often called like interactive news developers. So people like building applications, building software for the news. Um, in some ways you could just say, well, they're pretty much software developers working for a news environment. Um, but I do think that reporting um, journalistic sensibilities still guide that work. So for example, um, one iteration of the government salaries database had information that wound up being, um, it was too identifying. Like we had geographic information for people that we didn't anticipate being an issue because it was just where their office is. Uh, but, you know, it was through like discourse with uh, the union that we found, you know, actually this is, this could be a danger to people. So I think like journalistic sensibilities guided our decision about designing the app. In this case, you're saying because there was this identifiable geographic like data, they were at harm for like being kind of uh, doxed or like, I don't know, made public. They, they were at risk. Yeah. For, for being found. Yeah. I see. I see. Um, do you have a story of a project that you worked on that is one of your favorite data journalist kind of uh, projects that you worked on or something you're really proud of or would, can share with us? Yeah, I think I'm, I'm most passionate about a project I worked on at the Oregonian with uh, Rebecca Wollington and Molly Harberger uh, that started with a pretty routine process. Uh, Rebecca Wellington was looking through use of force reports from the Portland Police Bureau, and she found, um, and this was this these stats were not presented together, um, but she's an investigative reporter, and she noticed that um, almost half of the instances of use of force in this report were against homeless people, and you know clearly homeless people are not half the population of Portland, so. She wanted to know what the story is here. Um, so she, I, I believe she built on records that had already been requested, but the short story is she and I wound up with um, like 600 megabytes of police data. So over 20 years of arrests and charges, something like 1.3 million rows. Uh, and they were all in separate files. So, and of course they had slightly different uh, schemas. So I used Python to stitch together these, these files. Um, it was something like, you know, 25 arrest data files, 25 charge data files, and those had to be merged together. And there were a lot of interesting problems in that data from a technical standpoint. Uh, I had to do a lot of like fuzzy matching. I had to think about entity recognition. Like how do you recognize somebody as a particular entity in part because when people are arrested, their information is taken at face value. So when people are booked, their information might be confirmed with ID, but sometimes, and especially with what are called transient people in the data, they are, um, they may not have the right, um, they might use an alias or the date of birth might be wrong. So, Anyway, um, it took a long time, but uh, after doing some matching on, you know, what is called transient and then looking at addresses and, and speaking with policy experts, we found that half of the arrests in Portland in 2017 were of homeless people. It was somewhat more than half. Wow. That's, yeah, that's a really staggering statistic. It is staggering. I mean... It's very hard to know exactly what proportion of people in Portland are what you would call homeless, but it's not going to be anywhere near 52%. I mean, the most generous interpretation is something like three to five. So when you when you notice this in the data, what is the next step from there? Does the story, in this case, did the story come from the data or were you specifically looking for something because you had a hunch um, that that might be the case? Yeah, Rebecca deserves the credit for that that hunch. I mean, she 
it was I, I love that in this report, these numbers weren't next to each other. You know, at no point in the report did it say 43 percent of uses of force, you know, but she put it together because she was like reading closely. And from there, she requested data and she knew how to request the data because she is a big nerd and knew the name of the software system they use, for example. Um, so I expected, I, I thought it was uh, plausible that homeless people would be overrepresented to some extent. Uh, I didn't even remotely expect half. And uh, I mean, the next step after a finding like that is saying that has to be wrong. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, I, I typically, I admit when I, when I'm on a story and I'm excited, I might, um, go faster with exploration and just report kind of, okay, well, I wrote code for like three hours and this is what seems like I found. How does that check out with your reporting and your understanding of the topic? And they might say like, that sounds exciting or yeah, that's boring or whatever. Um, because, you know, data journalism is a very expensive process, both in terms of like time and my salary. So I, I don't, I don't want to explore every tangent to its fullest extent before I check in with somebody who understands the discipline. So we found that and we thought, well, that's bizarre. I don't, you know, and the short story is before we even published, we presented our findings to the police bureau and they corroborated our findings, uh, which helped me rest easier. Um, because again, something that outlandish feels like it, it must be wrong. So did they, what do you mean corroborated? Did they like agree with, did they agree yeah, with they, or, uh, Yeah, that is to say they ran their own analysis and said like, you know, I, I think part of what's good about using code for this work is that it's to some extent self-documenting. So with Rebecca, we were able to set, you know, specific criteria for how a person is defined as homeless, for example, specific criteria for identifying individuals because um, the short story is that the codes we were given in the data didn't correspond exactly to arrests. We kind of had to synthesize data to do that. So we were able to share our findings and also say like, these are our parameters. Um, yeah. Yeah. To be maximally transparent. What was it like when that story published? I'm, I'm guessing there was a story that came out of that, that got that went public. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, we published the initial story and then I published a follow up with some like, you know, quick uh, graphics that I did in Tableau just to um, make sure the story was out um, and, and with some follow up data. It was pretty astounding. I mean, there was a uh, there was a, a public meeting um, organized by local government to, you know, invite people to respond. Um, we saw other publications reporting it as well. We got a lot of reader feedback, you know, incisive questions and also, of course, some pushback, which is to be expected. Um, I think it was just it was good to see that um, several conversations in the community between citizens and the local government um, followed that. Yeah. Did did anything change um, as a result of that? I hope I'm I'm not coming across as uncharitable when I say I don't think so. Um, it's really hard to tell. I think I think even just you know, and now it's been two years since publication is still like pretty fast turnaround for for what what, what most people would consider substantial results. Um, I think the public having that knowledge helps guide, uh, you know, voting decisions or the way in which people engage with policy. Um, I have heard of, of conversations about decriminalizing some statutes that seem to target the homeless population. Um, uh, not things like, you know, like violent crime, of course, irrespective of your housing status is something that, you know, people are going to want uh, the police to take seriously, but things like trespass or uh, camping, which is already supposed to be decriminalized, you know, I think, I think it's important for the citizens of Portland to hear what our resources are going to, and then express to the government whether they think that those 
priorities align with their own. Yeah. I mean, keeping people accountable. And also, I always think that awareness is such a underappreciated tool of just making the public or making anyone aware of something. Because I think that that's where, you know, solving problems or, or, you know, evolving um, stems from. And so it's, yeah, I think that's definitely something I think that data journalism, some some of the projects I've seen in this one that you're mentioning um, really provide clarity because the data, you know, nobody reads the data. <laughs> Not a lot of people, you know, yeah. it's hard, it's hard to. I think that's been sometimes, I think as a person who is really into data and coding, I usually expect more response about like methodology and analysis and, um, and, and the like. Uh, in this case, we have the arrest data, and actually anybody can request it, but we were a little cagey about releasing it because that's private information. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I do I do typically want people to engage more with the data, but I, I still think it's really important that it's out there. I think um, I think when we think of like really good investigative journalism, we think of like, Woodward and Bernstein, we think of something like catastrophic and world changing, but even then, like their reporting didn't, wasn't actually like, uh, the cat, the, the like sole catalyst, but it still matters that this is being documented. I think that's part of what's sad about seeing the decline of journalism is like, maybe it's not evident day to day right now, the impact of losing journalism in your community, but it will be 50 years from now when we like, we just have this black box um yeah why why do you think data journalism is important assuming you think it's important i'm assuming you think I it's, do important. Think it's important because <laughs> you're talking about it yeah <laughs> why, why is it important convince me um i think the best data journalism surfaces information that most people don't have the means either, you know, educationally or technologically to access. Um, I think it's democratizing because the very best kinds of data reporting um, don't just provide data, but curate it for you, like set context and explain where it came from and, you know, what you can expect um, and empower readers to, to follow through on their own. Yeah. Um, I think data reporting, I mean, sometimes, honestly, I've asked for data and learned from that process that I'm the first person to ever look at it. Wow. Yeah. Like and some what, agencies are collecting it because of a mandate, but they aren't actually doing anything with it. Um, a lot of responsibility in that, I, I, would, I would assume. Yeah. I always feel like I'm missing something, mm. but yeah. And I think also... Um, Data journalism, I think, will help illustrate to people what is being collected. Um, yeah, and maybe like illustrate the processes that institutions go through. Because like data, things like the census, for example, it seems like a pretty, um, you know, unsexy topic. And yet billions of federal dollars are spent according to census information. That's so. true, Yeah. Who, in your opinion, is like, I don't know, the Michelangelo or the Lady Gaga, whoever uh, is like the, the best of our time in data journalism? Who's somebody that you look up to um, or the Beatles, whatever, <laughs> whatever reference you want to use? Um, like, who, who do you think is like one of the best of our time uh, in data journalism at this at this moment? Wow. No pressure on that person to live up to those names, but you get the vibe. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I think uh, I, I no one will be surprised when I say Amanda Cox. Tell me, who is uh, Amanda Cox? Is is astounding. Um, uh, she she has a data science background, and she just has consistently the most um, like creative approach to data journalism that I've seen. Like she is so experienced, I think she she takes design risks, but not willy nilly. Um, she's given a talk at a um, at a data visualization conference I love called IO, uh, and actually a, a couple of years ago gave a talk on visualizing uncertainty. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, just like ways of because I think it it's um, it, it's actually guided my work. So for example, like I used to even in simple charts and graphs just report um, 
whatever measure of central tendency, typically like a median. But because of Amanda Cox, I started reporting margin of error too. What does that mean? Um, that is to say, like, uh, so the census is a, is, an, is a great example again. Um, the census provides you an estimate, like in so specifically the American Community Survey. Uh, a useful thing to know about their data approach is they can't actually get the precise data from every single person in the world, right, or in the states. Um, so they sample and then extrapolate from their sample whatever information. There's a certain amount of error associated with that, and the census reports that as well. So, you know, I did a story at some point for the Oregonian on um, on modes of transportation to work and how long, I think, how long those trips are taking and or like what proportion of the population is using one form of transportation versus another. And I not only demonstrated, you know, I not only like depicted graphically, you know, how those medians have changed from one decade ago to now, but I've also illustrated uh, uh, graphically the margin of error such that like sometimes you see, oh, it looks like there's a difference in how many people are driving now versus a decade ago, but the error bar overlaps such that like maybe like in the true universe of results, they aren't actually different. What do you like? What do you do with that data in that case? That's another one of those examples where I I felt like I slept better, and this is something I've I've learned about. Um, I just listened to a podcast called The Queen, um, uh, and it's about like the history of uh, the welfare queen, uh, Linda Taylor. And one of the the, uh, the guy who wrote a book on this and was doing this podcast for Slate was interviewing other journalists who have written books and long form pieces like David Gran, who wrote about um, the systematic murder of the Osage Indians. Um, yeah, it's like the founding of the FBI. Anyway, I'm starting to sound like I'm talking chemtrails. But anyway, um, cool. uh, he was talking to reporters and he said, like, what's difficult is um you want to okay you know i forgot who it was so Take your time. the person who said it was his name is james foreman jr and he wrote this excellent book called locking up our own and he is different from the other people that the journalist was talking to because he's a law professor and he undertook this kind of like journalistic endeavor to write a book about mass incarceration and he said that something that he had to learn coming from an academic background is um you, you just have to cut stuff out like sometimes you have to leave people with some amount of uncertainty. Sometimes you have to leave people with something that is like intellectually or narratively dissatisfying. Um, whereas like he as an academic wants to follow every single tangent, like include every bit of literature and be as exhaustive as possible. But that's really overwhelming for the reader. Yeah. So similarly, like I really liked that I included <laughs> margin of error and median in in the graphics i'd like to think i did so in a user-friendly way but you know like that's tough because maybe somebody will see that graphic and say like what the heck is that and kind of walk away from it in a way that just seeing simple median might not drive them away so it's always a trade-off yeah that's that's really tricky when you're when you're learning to become a data journalist or if you're practicing to become it like where does is there a conversation in there about ethics or kind of like these kind of discrepancies because this i mean what you're what you're bordering on right now is i mean in some ways a, a conversation of like how you read the data to project a truth um maybe that's just a, a general journalistic question as well maybe it you know more more widely but um is there training in this or is this like you're kind of on your own if you're getting into this field yeah that is a great question i mean I, I, I'd like to think of myself as like a sort of longtime practitioner. Like I've been in, in conversations about fidelity to truth and, and graphical representations of data since like undergrad. So about like seven years now, uh, cause I used to be a lab scientist and it's the same deal. I, uh, before I had any idea I was going to be in journalism, I was having conversations with colleagues about lying with charts because, you know, when you present um, statistics, like figures in your academic papers, so I was studying neuroscience, 
you know, you have the same issues, like present the same baseline for every figure. And if you don't, you could be misleading your reader. Um, you know, at least with an academic publication, there is the premise, although it doesn't actually hold, that you have people, because they are subject matter experts, closely identifying, like, or closely examining every figure and, and checking you. And sometimes that's not true. Um, basically, anybody can lie with statistics. Uh, yeah, so it's a pervasive issue. I don't want to say that, like, fraud and lying are, are pervasive, but, like, this this tension between wanting to elide some of like the statistical intricacies in a graphical representation or present information in a way that's friendly to people while being honest is, is very difficult. I mean, the same thing happens in text, right? Like I think um, in conversations around like, Oh, what is trustworthy j journalism and whatnot? Like, um, the headline you decide to run on an identical story, right, could could polarize people in, in totally different ways. Um, I think people are interrogating uses of phrase like racially charged. Like, well, what does that mean? You know, what even is racially charged? Um, we at least have like the AP style book for uh, text. Oh, for text. Yeah, there is a course. data journalism section in the AP style book. Oh, I didn't but, know that. Yeah. Um, but I, I, uh, it's not as exhaustive as I think is needed. Um, I think we we you know are we rely on editors to hold us accountable and we hold each other accountable too. Is that a is that a kind of a useful place for people to look who might be considering getting into data journalism or want you know more of a sense of how to format? Is it about formatting the data that they present or yeah, it's kind the of data? like it's 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 like really broad strokes. I think it's a good like introduction to data journalism. It's not exhaustive. Um, uh, there is there's a classic book numbers in the newsroom by Sarah Cohen who who left the New York Times a couple years ago um, and there is I don't remember its exact name there's like this introduction to uh, teaching computational journalism or something it's like a free ebook and it's actually beautifully designed uh, I think that's really useful too for kind of talking mm -hmm. about the state of the art and best practices um, yeah, that's great. I, I would love to link to those and put those in the transcript and the show note uh, afterwards so that anybody listening, um, it sounds like these are some pretty good places to start if you want to, you know, become a data But also uh, uh, any, any given story, um, my favorite reporters, um, I, you know, like uh, ProPublica is really good about this. Uh, NJ.com was really good about this uh, publishing methodology with their work. And I really like that because it's, it's not as likely to be overwhelming like you have a particular topic, okay, use of force in the state of New Jersey. What does that look like? Um, how do you investigate that? And then having like a, a methodology for that allows you to a ask your own questions um, and, and also like try to reproduce their findings. Oh, interesting. So yeah, so having a methodology per each um, story that you're getting into, that's what you're saying? Yeah, especially, I mean, I if, if I were my best self, I would do it for everything I do, but at least for like larger stories, I think that's important. Um, yeah. So you're saying ProPublica Pro does this pretty well. If people were to go there, they, they could see this on this on some of their work there. It's... Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and you know, my colleagues at Reveal, giving them a shout out. Nice, um, yeah. Same thing with uh, um, uh, Aaron Senkin and Manuel Martinez did a, a huge analysis of... Uh, mortgage data, um, basically analyzing modern day redlining and also wrote up like how they did what they did and used Py um, Emmanuel used Python for that. And I just really like that, you know, people could, you know, and like not everybody has investigative journalism background like that, but they can feel empowered to start asking questions themselves. Like, I, I don't think enough people realize, like, you don't have to be a journalist to ask for public records. Mm -hmm. And certainly I just, I feel like I know a lot of people learning to code who want to, who ask me like, how do I stay motivated? And I always say like a project, find a project you're, you're really passionate about. hundred percent. A project yeah. with a deadline. Yes. <laughs> I usually say yeah. like you have to be accountable to somebody. Um, there's yeah. a, and there's a lot of projects out there. You know, if you just start asking, man, just tweet it out. I'm sure somebody will give you a, pro you know, I mean, you know, find something you're somewhat passionate about would help also, but there's, yeah, I agree. I, I, I really agree with that sentiment. Um, yeah. I'd love to hear how you became a data reporter. Um, what what was what was your major in college? Where did you go to college? 
Uh, I went to Reed College here in Portland, Oregon. Nice. Um, so did you study I did journalism? Uh, no, I studied psychology and neuroscience. Okay. So first I was going to do uh, behavioral neuroscience. I used to, I was a research assistant at OHSU and actually like coding and data came up there too because, um, Oh yeah. What I mean, way? At, some, at some point a grad student asked me to try to write some Excel macros and I, I noped out of that. Uh, yeah. and also noped out of neuroscience grad school, which I was told to do. I mean, I, that's what I thought I was going to do up until like my last year of college. And then thanks to that exposure realized like, that's not really what I want to be doing, but I still did an, an undergraduate neuroscience thesis. And the short story is I wound up with, um, gigs of data and I couldn't actually use Excel or anything like that for it. And, and the, the premise of the experiment was, um, a replication of, a of a previously conducted and published experiment anyway. So I wanted to try to reproduce everything that the original authors did using only open source software. So it actually went up on GitHub. And I mean, like I was learning all of this in one year. It's like, learn how to use Git, learn how to use Bash. Um, I tried learning Python and just had more trouble with it. So my first set of analyses were published in R. Um, but I just found the community super welcoming. So I got into programming thanks to PyLadies here in Portland, where I'm now an organizer. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, but finding a community, meeting regularly, kind of helped me stay inspired. Yeah. What does it look like to find a community? Is that in person once a week? Is it a community online? What, what does that look like? Um, mostly in person. Now we have a Slack. Back then it was just in person. Um, and they, you know, just meeting regularly to ask questions about code. Um, the organizers encouraged me to try to go to PyCon as a student. Um, Before you even really knew Python, you were going to a Python, the main Python con uh, concert uh, conference. <laughs> yes, I actually felt really guilty about that. I thought, you know, I'm not a real programmer, so I shouldn't go. And they said, like, look, it's fine to go as a beginner. And actually, that conference did totally change my life. Oh, um, tell me. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I was still a student. I had no idea what I was going to do after college because I had decided not to go to grad school for neuroscience anyway. Um, and I wandered by this booth, uh, which was at the time the IPython notebook booth. Uh, and I, I was told, I know you know, uh, you, you know, go check out IPython notebook. And I had no idea what it was. Okay. And I actually hovered behind people because I was really scared and somebody sitting at the booth, um, his name is Matt Davis. Um, uh, just called me over and said, like, hey, what, what are your questions? And I said, look, I honestly have no idea what's happening, but I was told to look out for IPython notebook because I'm a scientist. And he said, OK, like, here, let me show you. And he actually, like, walked me through setting up my development environment and setting up IPython notebook and the like. Um, so that was amazing. I mean, just I didn't realize that uh, a programming community could be so welcoming. I mean, I didn't really have any ideas, right? I hadn't been to many conferences at all. I think that was my first ever conference. Um, and then later that day, I saw a talk by Jessica McKellar on uh, how the internet works. And I've actually, um, I've started teaching that class now. Oh, like yeah. at journalism conferences. Yeah, okay. I mean, I it was networking. I had no concept of what the internet was at the time. Um, I think because of her... Well, I think at the same time I was taking like an internet class that was a studio art class also taught by a former engineer. So I just got really excited about like, ooh, like pinging and trace route. And when she was expressing these, you know, technical ideas, she did it with such joy um, and such excitement that it made me feel like, wow, this, this actually feels like where I belong, like figuring things out and, and taking things apart. And, you know, because of all that, like I, you know, I'm a PyLadies organizer now. Um, I teach people Jupyter Notebook, now what is now Jupyter Notebook, a big evangelist. So yeah, so following that, I started working for a tech nonprofit called the Center for Open Science. Um, they were the folks that encouraged me to seek out this IPython notebook stuff. I started learning more programming and really enjoyed that. And then uh, I worked for a time at this place called Periscopic as a data analyst there kind of doing data visualization. That's how I got into that community. Oh, okay. And actually that's, I feel like that's actually my first foray into data journalism because I was, I would be given a data set and a task and I would try to do it with Excel 
and Excel would crash or, you know, no, no uh, hard feelings for Excel, but I, I got large data sets and didn't know what to do. And ultimately I found like, I'll just, I had kind of given up on Python because I had first started using it for web development. And I didn't really like web development. And then, you know, I'd say, okay, well, I, I'll just try to do this one task in Python and I'll do the rest of it in Excel. And basically like the story of me teaching myself Python was just increasingly doing things like that. Um, I had already spent a lot of time using Codecademy, uh, Think Python, I read cover to cover. Um, I would read blog posts and tutorials, but it was really like, I feel like um, churning those in to like a, a task I needed to accomplish every day really drove me. Yeah. And from there I got into, uh, I was a data engineer for a couple of years at Simple. Simple and, is the, uh, um, the credit, credit card, right? Yeah, they, the uh, bank, they're the a bank. bank. Or a bank, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I heard recently that there might be a simple credit card unaffiliated. But anyway, uh, yeah, it's a bank. Um, and there I I kept writing Python. I learned uh, some Clojure, too, some Scala. Not, I would not say to anyone that I know Scala, but I really enjoyed Clojure. What did, um, what did Scala or Clojure offer you that Python didn't? Why did you um, do that? Uh, I I started learning Clojure because like the other person like started authoring this tool in Clojure, and so I, I was using Clojure and Elasticsearch um, to set up a, a search interface, like a re remodeled search interface. Um, I had not really used functional programming before, so it was just like interesting to uh, step out of the object oriented model a bit, and like basically from there learn to abstract principles c of computing in a way that. I wasn't prepared to before because I only took one computer science class in college. And uh, hilariously, the professor, this is in the math department, started us with Haskell mm -hmm. <laughs> and then moved us to Java, which is so different. And we jumped around to like assembly. Anyway, it was like very bizarre and really eclectic. Tough, really tough stuff there. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I not, not as user friendly. I mean, after that, Python felt like a breeze. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, learning to abstract certain principles and like learning principles of data engineering um, made me a much better data journalist because I got a sense of like, okay, this is how you stand up a Postgres database. Like, this is how you get programs to talk to each other and so on. So yeah. Um, so, what skills do you think a data journalist needs to know? You you know you've mentioned a few things that you've kind of done in your career. I'm hearing Python. I'm hearing um, Postgres, which is the, a database that is, is pretty popular. Um, you using Jupyter Notebook, it sounds like, uh, comes up a lot. Um, can you kind of just give me like a short list of, let's just say if, I, if somebody listening is thinking, you know, this is really cool. I want to maybe go down this path. What would be kind of like the top, you know, five, whatever, um, list of this is kind of where you start. And these are some things you also should um, consider learning. Yeah. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is regular expressions. Okay. Like right. I don't care what what programming tool you're using. Uh, you there's actually like Google Sheets has a regex match function. Yeah. Like, if you're listening to this, like, <laughs> data journalism, wherever you are, regular expressions are fun and cool, and they go so far <laughs> yeah, you're in helping you. You're kind of blowing that. my mind right now because, like, I feel like I'm not that great at regular expressions. <laughs> I wouldn't pretend I'm great at it, but <laughs> I will say, I mean, it's just so fun. Um, I've heard that, uh, though. I've heard that from a few people. So re re could you explain what regular expressions are just to anybody that might have never heard of that term before? How would you describe it? Um, it's not a programming language. It's like a method or something. It's a method, yeah. yeah. And so, and, and indeed, like the implementations can vary based on the language. But um, it's, I guess, I would say it's a protocol for parsing text. Yeah, it's like um, a way to kind of search through text or filter, I guess, text. Yeah, yeah. So, so for example, um, let's say you're setting up a form and you want people to respond to it. Yeah, it's and, a great example. Yeah. Uh, uh, you want somebody to give their phone number. Perfect. You can use this tool called a regular expression to say only accept from the user an input with, it's like, I don't even know 
phone numbers anymore. Like, yeah, like 10 nine, digits. 10 digits. Or like only accept an email with the at symbol. This is like all the validation that you see on forms. It tends to be yeah. like some kind of regular Email expression. is infamous. Email yeah. is way worse. But yeah, like, you know, accept this from the, from the user. Yeah. Um, it's basically like pulling out patterns. So for example, I used regular expressions when I was going through this police data because this is this is just written down by an officer really quickly and then you know manual data entry is rife with this so transient was a word they were looking for but it was sometimes spelled transient or trainascent or whatever so i wound up writing a regular expression that said pull search through the text and pull back anything that starts with like um t r a and wow, then wow ends card. with NT. Oh, I see. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, something yeah. like that. Um, yeah, it, it's 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 very flexible. And you know, the fun thing too about regular expressions is, you you can. I don't know how to do this. One can work to ensure their regular expressions are maximally performant. But for most of us, whether in journalism or engineering, like you just write the thing that works, like. False positives are, you know, false positives and false negatives are an issue, but like you write the thing that works and it's very fun. Um, I recommend this site called regex101.com. Cool. Okay. Uh, it's like a really quick interactive tool that you can use to like test out regular expressions. Um, uh... And it's a didactic tool as well. So it color codes sequences that you're matching on and explains to you the mechanism by which like that is a match. Um, I really love that, that strategy. So regular expressions. I would say either SQL or Python, just as a means of um, illustrating to yourself like how data is structured. Um, part of the reason I advocate for SQL is I once worked with a reporter who told me, "All right, I'm getting some, I'm having some issues with redacted agency. Um, I I wanted one more column from the table, and they're telling me it's going to be seven hundred dollars." And, you know, I looked over like what he'd requested and basically what I worked out was like, oh, you just have to add one more field to your select statement. So I told him like, okay, maybe this won't make sense to you, but you should go back to them and say, this is only adding one more line to a select statement. There is no way it needs to be $700. And if it is like, please provide me an itemized like description of what you're doing. And he wound up getting the records for free. Oh, I love it. Yeah. So even if you aren't writing, like, I mean, you should, writing the code yourself illustrates to you, like, oh, these are the systems that people are using and that they're expressing to me. Like, not everybody is a bad actor, but, like, whether somebody is, I have helped agencies with data issues before. So, you know, irrespective of intention, you're having an understanding of how databases work. Um, even if you're not, like, a crackerjack data engineer, like, goes really far in helping you with your requests and knowing what you're asking for. Yeah, yeah, I love I love that because those are two of my favorite languages. Just because I think I think they're Python and SQL are, are somewhat easy. I don't say easy to learn. I mean, they are in a way, but because there's so much you can do with it, it, it can be like a lifetime kind of joy. Or, but like what I'm trying to say is that I think you can get some real satisfaction in like the first hour of learning. Like you can like learn a lot with a little, which is really powerful. Um, especially with Absolutely. the example the example you gave too. Like just being able to see, oh, your select statement. I mean. It, if, you, if you don't know what that is and you're listening, it's, it might sound like, I don't know what that is. But like you look at it and it's it's uh, it's very much like English. Like, you know, it's very it like, looks like natural language. It looks like natural language. And if you can just mm -hmm. kind of read it. Um, I'm curious, though, um, what would you say is the difference between you said Python or SQL? Would you choose one or the other? Because in my mind, they're like kind of different. But at the same time, I'd have a hard time explaining to somebody why they might use one or another. What? Do you have a time when you choose one or one over the other now that because you know both? Yeah, I would say like it, I guess it's weird to put those both in the same sentence because um, when I have used Python with SQL, I've still just been using like psycho PG2. It's not really it's like not a property of Python. I guess um, I, I lumped them together because my first thought was like these are, these are means by which you can teach yourself to think programmatically. Mm -hmm. uh, I think like SQL and Python are quite different. I think that, like you said, they both have a lot to offer somebody right away in terms of syntax. But um, um, 
day to day, I've used Python way more than SQL. Okay. Um, in part because typically when you ask for data from an agency, you're not you're not going to like query a database. You're going to get a data set, and you're going to use a tool to access that. Um, I strongly recommend people learn Python or R. But I do say to anybody, people with statistics backgrounds, I usually say like, take your pick. Yeah. Um, I personally think R remains the better language for graphics. Like their plotting is really beautiful in a way that I think Python hasn't caught up with. I'm sorry to everybody working in Matplotlib. But um, uh, if people aren't sure what they want to do and they aren't sure they want to get really heavy into the statistics, I actually say pick up Python because you have a variety of options. Like I've used Python for like personal automation. I've used it as a web developer, I've used it to um, do Secret Santa with my girlfriends every year. Uh, <laughs> Wait, what? Yeah, so I, I used, I, I've written a Python script to randomize our assignments to each other. And then uh, I, you have to build a new email account because you have to change their security settings to automate with Python. So I like made a Secret Santa email address. And so my script randomizes and emails everybody with their assignment. I so that none it. of us know. Yeah. That's so cool and nerdy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you can do stuff like that. Like that's Python's super really cool. flexible and it has a great community. Oh, that's super cool. Um, I, I have a question that maybe you can help me out with because I think you, you mentioned um, when you were talking about um, that people don't usually give you data that is sequelable um, I'll say you know that that um a lot of times you get a you're right a lot of times you'll get data it's in like a csv or it's in like ugh, maybe a pdf and then you have to kind of like ex take it out of there or something like yep. that but it's very rare that someone gives you a data file that's like a dot sql file so yeah. um is there an easy way if some if you do let's say you know sql or you learn sql is there an easy way to convert data that is uh, a csv or an excel into uh, a sql database yeah. Um, easy. So the, <laughs> I would say uh, Postgres has like a like a PG admin tool that is, um, uh, it, you know, it's browser based and it's relatively user friendly. Um, it's actually pretty surprisingly easy to learn, but it can still be finicky in my experience. There's also a tool if you can afford it. I think it can be quite cheap for an individual. And you at least get a free trial. It's called Navicat, and it's software that I've used, um, and I know, and I have suggested to reporters because, honestly, it has like a, a, a drag and drop uh, CSV upload interface, and from there you can practice, you know, composing SQL queries. That's um, super, yeah, that's super useful because I've been in that situation before where I wish I could have used SQL in certain situations, and I'm just like. Um, oh, I don't want to create the table from scratch and it's like, you know, all these steps. Um, so that's cool. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's cool. There's, there's some options for, for possibly converting that. Yeah. Um, what else? Um, okay. So you, we mentioned regex, reg, regular expressions, Python, SQL. Are there any other tools in the tool set of a data journalist that someone listening might want to become, um, learning <laughs> to learn yeah um absolutely like just inferential statistics just like look up numbers in the newsroom um or like the statistics classes on khanacademy.com like you don't have to in my experience like you get most of the way there for a good data story with simple statistics um, like you, most of the time you don't even need a regression. Uh, yeah. And, and also just like, just making sure you get the story, right. Like whether it's a daily story or a big investigation, having a sense of, and I think a lot of us have found, and you know, whether you're a data journalist or not, you'll see a story and say, and you'll find, oh, 30% of, um, 30% of people have dogs or something. You might read that and think, wow, that's shocking. And like my neighbor could say like, that seems low. Um, like understanding baseline, you know, like the way I articulated the problem earlier about like the homelessness arrests, like it, it can seem shocking on its face, but I can't just go out and tell people that it's not useful. I have to like explain to them like, well, this is what you would expect from baseline. 
And so I think just cult, like both like a formal study of statistics, it doesn't have to be in a classroom, in my opinion. Um, there, are, there are a lot of great books out there. There's a book, uh, Precision Journalism by Philip Meyer is a classic. Um, developing the habit of saying, what other information do I need for this to be a significant finding uh, rather than like trivia? Oh, yeah, that's I love that. That's really important. We, we talk, uh, oh yeah, yes, I'm Oh yeah, and I said the last one is like just, just a uh, reporting. Like, um, that's something that I, I say because I need to do, or I enjoy that and I'm increasingly like able to do that. Like, I read other reporting pretty widely, but I also like whenever I'm on a project, I read related reporting, I check out books, um, I read primary literature, I talk to people. Um, like I, th I don't think that my work can be good unless I'm working in concert with, with subject matter experts. That's great. Um, I feel like I've learned so much chatting with you today. Some of the things that come to mind for me is like, if I am interested in learning more about what data journalism is or, um, or following this path, you've given a lot of great books as well as, um, people like Amanda Cox and, um, some of the skills like regular expressions and Python. Like, I feel like I have a pretty good palette of, um, places I could go after this. And like I said, all of these will be available, um, on the site. I'll put all these links together. Um, if, if someone does all that and, and they're really passionate about kind of, you know, inspired from this chat and ready to go and do something in the world. Um, my final question would be, what is something uh, that you can, you can do maybe if you're, I don't know if you're going to become a data journalist or even if you just kind of want to step your foot into it. I know we were, we were talking that you tweeted this out and, and you had some people reply back and somebody, somebody asked the question, how do you do what they call tiny data journalism? I'm not sure if that's actually a term, but I like the idea like in your I local it, area. Yeah. Okay. So how do you do tiny data journalism? Um, shout out to your friend who put that on Twitter. Um, yeah. Kojo, that was a great question. That was a great question. Um, right. So that's what I'm wondering. Like, what do you do with all this? Like, how can you do some tiny data journalism and get started? Yeah. So actually, like, I got so excited talking about the past, I forgot to, like, segue into, like, how I got into data journalism. Tell me. Yeah. Um, I was working as an engineer, and I was approached by an editor. And I, I mean, I think part of that is I had done um, journalistic work. I just because I was drawn to it. So there's this um, this organization called Hack Oregon, uh, Portland based, where people vol people from a variety of disciplines get together and work on a project like a web application and they're volunteering their time um but they collaborate to build something a public service and i worked on that like a, a a campaign finance project a few years ago um just because you know i just want to be involved in my in my city in my state like i'm really passionate about local government um and I wanted to contribute in some way. So that was how I did it. I think, you know, if, if something like Hack Oregon um, or like there are Code for America brigades across the city. So Code for America is a program that will send fellows somewhere for a year to work on like civic tech projects. Um, and that's a formal program, but there are also like these brigades scattered across the country and you could start one yourself where you just, you go after the same kinds of problems. like. Like, I think it just has to start with like a question, like um, where, like who is paying for, uh, like who's uh, funding the mayoral race? Like, where's that money coming from? Um, are there more homeless people in my city now than there used to be? Uh, who is getting arrested and why? Um, like the Stanford Open Policing Project, for example, actually has traffic stops data for not a, they couldn't get it for every state, but they they made records requests of every state and many like cities within those states across the U.S. for um, who is being stopped and why, uh, including demographic information when they can. And you can take that and run with it. Um, yeah. So I think this like the sad part of this story is like not every newsroom in the country can afford to hire data journalists. I don't really know yet what the future of journalism looks like, but I do think it will be more collaborative. Like I know a lot of people in tech, especially who care deeply about the world and work or people to exercise and cultivate those skills and also like feel less helpless. And uh, before we leave, can you just tell me a little bit about um, PyLadies, which you're an organizer of now? What is, what is PyLadies? 
Pileades is great. Um, it's a nonprofit organization and it actually exists across the world. Um, I don't remember how many um, countries it exists in, but um, it's an international nonprofit. And in each city, people kind of shape um, how they meet up. So we have like a weekly informal meetup, but we also teach classes on data exploration or bash or get kind of complementary skills to that process. Um, everybody has a different strategy. Um, and just uh, aside from the meetups, they also have like a scholarship to help get people to, um, to PyCon each year. Um, yeah, and they have some online communities as well. Like there are some Slacks or wherever they're, they're on Twitter. Yeah. yeah. I think it's really cool that it sounds like you started with them there. That's where you learned a lot of your skills. And now you're also the organizer and advocate of, of this program. So it must, it must be pretty great for what I'm hearing. <laughs> it is great. It's, it's an excellent community. Um, I love my co-organizers. Uh, they're like dear friends of mine now. Um, it was, it was just like a way um also to hold myself accountable like to um to stay to really stay in python and also to share like all of the all of the generosity given to me mm. um i feel like i've been given a lot of opportunities and found a beautiful community and like absolutely want to keep that going i love this this is great um melissa thanks so much for um for chatting with us today is there somewhere that people can find you online that you'd like to send them to if they want to learn more about you uh, I'm on Twitter probably too much uh, as um, IFF underscore OR, mm -hmm. if and only if, uh, and on the revealnews.org website. Awesome. Well, I'll share all those links uh, in the transcript and notes. And yeah, thank you again so much for chatting today. This has been wonderful. All right, I wanna thank Melissa for coming on the show. All of the notes and transcripts and everything will be at our site, onemonth.com. You can go to the blog and while they're there, you can find more episodes on Python if you're looking to learn Python. Uh, the first episode of this podcast is a great one. It's uh, how to learn Python with Matan Griffel, who is a teacher, a professor at Columbia Business School where he teaches business school students how to use Python with data. Uh, he's also uh, my co-teacher. We teach together at onemonth.com, which is uh, what I think is the best first month of Python out there. A little biased because I'm one of the teachers. But that was our goal to create really just the fundamental and fun course for learning Python. So if that sounds interesting, you can go to onemonth.com and sign up for that. And yes, in that course, you will learn the fundamentals. It's for very beginners. And it's also you know, packed with a lot of good stuff that data journalists would use, looking at data, looking at Jupyter Notebooks and APIs and all this kind of stuff. So check that out. If you have any questions for me about the podcast, about the courses or any of this, you can email me at teachers at one month.com. All right. Thanks for listening. And I'll see you in a future episode.